Well, everybody, welcome back to the Trick Podcast of Joy and Gosa TV on this beautiful Wednesday, May 6th. May the 4th be with you. That's over. Cinco de Mayo was yesterday. Well, today is May 6th. And as life does, life and things just keep going, don't they? Talking today about what is the future of the church. Leave me a comment below. Say hello. Make sure that you say hola. What's happening? Tell me where you're watching me from. Are you in the office? Are you at home in bed on the couch? Are you on the road? Are you on a Zoom call? What are you doing? Maybe you're on your afternoon walk. It's 4.20 p.m. Pacific here in the Long Beach, California area from the Ghost of Studios, welcoming you to this daily stream, talking about the things that really matter most to us in light of this transition, of this opportunity, of this experience that we are all going through globally as a global village. Leave me a comment below and you, it'll appear right on the screen right there where it says the chat is ready. Let me know if you are watching. I have a little counter here. You obviously can see on your end who's here. And sometimes we have zero people. Sometimes we have one. Sometimes we have two. It really depends. We have seven platforms that we're streaming to. So maybe on your end it says zero, but maybe on another platform it says three or four. So that's how the game is played. But uh, let me do something here really quick. I'll be right back. All right, I had to get my drink here. Oh man, it's so hot. It's like what, 91 degrees here in the LA area? Ah, so good. I got a bunch of water. I had some food. I've been working on my sermon for Sunday and been uh, thinking about the church leadership. So I want to give you five things that I think you need to consider if you are a church goer or perhaps if you are in some sort of leadership in the church. No matter where you are, here are the five things. Number one is money has changed. So the way that churches have been doing money, meaning tithes and offerings, it obviously has changed from dramatically. It could be that things are better for you, worse. It might be that your audience might be late to adapting to just the online tools or mailing in the checks into the church. You might get a lot of people that aren't on your live stream. The statistics are that 30% of your average church attenders are actually watching you online. And the rest are people that are kind of friends on your page or people that are inviting their followers. And so all those are positive things. But as far as turning customers or, or, or uh, viewers into customers, meaning to have people actually give to the church, you're going to have to come up with more creative ways to make ends meet. And so that's obviously changing. Number two is I think we have to go from a building that has an online presence to a online church that has a bis that has a building presence. Let me say that again. We have to go from being a building that has an online presence to a, here's my Amazon guy, to a online church that has a building physical presence. Maybe you listen to Larry Osborne's. He's the pastor for North Coast Church. He's, uh, he's down there in the San Diego area. And he posted a video, I think it was this morning, talking about three major changes that he believes are coming to the church. And one of them is he's saying, don't rush to go back to your building. And he talked about children and how parents may not want to drop off their kids to be with other kids who they don't know, parents they don't know, seniors, how they may not want to come out of their buildings because of health concerns. The experience itself might be really bad because if everyone's spread out, it might feel empty in the room and people get discouraged. You, you may see a drop in attendance because at first people want to come and see everyone, but then once... They kind of feel like things aren't the same and they can just stay at home and watch the service. They may not come back. And so I have been getting ready for this online church for a long time. I mean, I've been live streaming for about 10 years, podcasting for 15, blogging for over 20 years since Blogger began. And I tell you that only because, you know, us creatives and us maybe risk takers, we are into new trends. And so when live streaming began, 
whatever it was, five, 10 years ago, I jumped on the wagon because I knew that this was going to be something very important. And so now, obviously, every church is doing live streaming very well, and they have either they're either using their gear that they already had or they went on Amazon and bought out, you know, every PTZ optic camera or whatever. But here's my point. I'm not going to rush to go back to the facility because even though the Bible, of course, says that we need to not disregard the coming together of worship, people are afraid. People still have both a desire to see everyone, but also they want to make sure that everyone is safe, mainly themselves and their kids and their parents. And so, and even beyond that, here's my point. For the longest time, we all have been trying to reach the world with the gospel. The gospel message is a global gospel. It goes from the inside out. The Bible says that we ought to make disciples in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the outermost parts of the world. Every leader, every churchgoer, we all want to make a difference in the world. Now, what I have noticed in our Zoom calls, in our Sunday morning live streams, is that people can invite their friends much more easily than ever before. First, you don't have to talk to anybody and say, oh, come to my church. It's at 1030. It's at 9 a.m. Or what do I wear? Well, I go to the Catholic church. Oh, I am busy or I'm at work. All those obstacles are gone. All you have to do is tag your friend in the comments on your Facebook or YouTube page or wherever you're watching Instagram. And immediately, if you want, obviously, it's still a choice that people have to make. You can invite your followers. And it might take a week, two weeks, maybe three months. At some point, you may have some of those family members back in Mexico or in, in another part of the world. Or maybe that just our family members that live in another state tune in to see your church. And in some ways, experience church together as a family. I mean, I think I mentioned this last week, two weeks ago on our Zoom Bible study that we have on Thursday nights. For the first time in maybe 30 years, I had my sisters, both of them that live in Nicaragua, my mom who's here visiting, my wife, our three children that were all here, and myself as well as other members of our church all together worshiping God. I think it was for Good Friday. Yeah. That will never happen again. And it had never happened before. But because Zoom is as easy as boom, you just click on the link and member and all that stuff. And because the internet is, you know, high speed and all this stuff, we're able to spread the gospel to more people. And we will never be able to do that if we go back to our traditional churches. Ever. No one in another part of the world will ever be able to tune in and to actually worship with you, meaning, you know how the Zoom window has all the pictures and the faces? I probably, if, let's say we go back to church tomorrow as usual, I will never see my sisters again on the screen with me. I also had my niece. I think her husband was online. And that's not me. I know all of us have been experiencing the same thing. Number three, I think love and serving the poor has changed completely. You know, like there are some churches that would do like Mission Sunday, like one Sunday out of the year, they would go and think of the poor and the needy. Well, guess what? Everyone now is the poor and the needy because we're all so connected. You're connected to a friend who's struggling with this virus. You're connected to your maybe a senior that is going through some challenges. You're, you're connected to someone at work that lost their job. You yourself feel like you're the needy and the poor. So now we have a collective. Thank you, uh, Moses. Hermano, thank you for your comment. We have a collective sense of we are the needy and the poor. And of course, there are people that are even more difficult situations than us. And so, for example, at our church, every summer for the last three years, we've done this thing called Get Moving. Because as you know, when you work with urban cities, which really, you know, every city is an urban city. 
we can't even say, oh, you work in an inner city church. Unless you live in Orange County, and maybe only some parts of Orange County, every LA County church is an inner city church, multi-ethnic church, okay? I mean, obviously there are some exceptions, but you know what I mean. But when you, when you, when you work among the poor, when you work among people like me and you, the average person on the street in Southern California, so I am talking specifically about Southern California, you know that the, the issues of weight, immune system, vaccination, illiteracy, ADHD, obesity, of uh, depression, anxiety, this is what reaching out to our neighbors looks like in 2020. 16, 18, 20, 25. This is our new normal, even before this happened. And so like many churches, we hired a therapist to be on site. And she wasn't just there visiting or talking to people. She did. She does uh, workshops for our family. She brought NAMI, who is a National Association of Mental Health Institute, and she brought training in English and Spanish. She herself, she herself works with Kaiser and with um, I, I believe the other health center in Torrance. And she is a on the go therapist. She visits many places. And this is not, again, just uh, only unique to us. Many churches have done this. And whereas maybe that was avant garde or oh, that's not real discipleship. Now, how are you going to disciple families who are struggling with mental health issues? with a father who's even more of an alcoholic now because he's lost his job or because he's cooped up in the house. They say that pedophilia, I mean, I, I even just hate even saying or thinking the thought, is, is rising. So you as a church who's been doing the traditional small groups, Bible studies and all that stuff, which is wonderful, guess what? Now you are waking up to the fact that Bible studies have to be now along the issues of recovery. And that recovery or celebrate recovery, it's not just a Friday night thing for those 10%. Now it's for 90% of your church because now we're all in recovery. And yet the gospel is the answer, but not in the traditional ways. I remember in 2017, and I've been thinking about this for a long time, if you can imagine. This has been front of my mind for at least five years. I remember in 2017... I gathered my staff and I said, we need to have a memorial service for our church. We need to have a memorial service for our church. And everyone's like, what are you talking about? We're trying to grow and reach more people and spread the gospel. I said, no. The way that we've been doing church since 1910, 1980, 1995 even, is gone. And we, you know, because I'm a numbers guy, as much as I am a creative, I am a numbers guy. Maybe I should say I'm a data guy. I, I, not that I love it, but I, you know, I have my feet on the ground. I look at the data. What are the numbers telling us? Not just in my little church, but in the society, LA County, California, the nation, the world. My undergrad is in engineering. And so I've always been a, a data numbers guy. And so I began to see the trend in 2017 of churches like ours, an urban city like ours, financially, mental health issues, obesity, what would discipleship look like? And I remember telling, as I said, my staff, we need to have a funeral. Everyone's like, what are you talking about? Well, guess what? <laughs> the funeral happened. It happened in 2020. Not just for my church, but for every church in America. Now, I don't mean that the church is dead or that the gospel is dead. Of course not. I mean, they, that's anathema. Of course, the gospel is alive and, 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 and relevant as ever before. But what I mean is the system, the systems that we've been holding up. And so now is the time for every one of us to have a memorial service. I know this may be shocking. It may not be what you want to hear. You may be thinking, I'm just blowing smoke or I'm just talking out of the... Uh, you know, just nonsense. And that's what everyone thought in 2017 when I said it. You need to have a memorial service for how church used to be. Now, you may be thinking, our oh, church is thriving. We just opened a brand new facility. We've been reaching the homeless and the poor and the immigrants. We've, we've been growing by 30% every year since 2020, since 2015. That's great. But if you look at the data... The people that you've been growing with have needs underneath them that 
this crisis revealed. Loneliness, aggression, separation, the family unit being disband disbanded. I mean, materialism, violence, hate, fear, politics, all these things that people accuse the church of being the number one culprit. You know, who was the culprit of Trump being elected? If you were obviously on the Democratic side, who did you blame? White evangelical Christians, the WECs as I call them, right? If you were on the liberal side, moderate side, or on the conservative side, who did you blame? The illegals. You blame the liberal media, right? So we were just there. And whether you believe in, in energy, vibration, and the universe speaking, or obviously for those of us that know Jesus, the Bible says in Romans 8 that creation groans. There's no doubt that this is creation groaning wildly, violently to say, no mas, stop. Well, Trig, but this is a conspiracy theory by the, by the liberals. This is, you know, Bill Gates wanting to get rich through this vaccine. You know, this is the Antichrist coming. All of that is in play. All of that is in play. This is all part of the grand apocalyptic, and really it's more of a creation story of God. A new earth and a new Jerusalem is coming. And so, yes, but in the meantime, the Bible says that we need to grieve not as those who have no hope. In the meantime, the traditional church we knew has been relevant to the masses for a while, now super magnified, have to now transition with the tech, a new normal we're heading towards. Exactly. Yes. Absolutely, Moses. The technology, I have three things. Technology being one. Second is tithes, offerings, and our financial plans also have been upended. And then third, as I mentioned, discipleship, worship, and evangelism has been upended for the good. For the good. As I was saying about um, discipleship, and disciple making, and evangelism. I've always been a fan of Greg Laurie, Billy Graham. You know, I've always said, Lord, use me like those men. He might, he might use you and me as those amazing men. Maybe you're, you're the people that you, you admire are maybe, uh, it's maybe your parents. You want to be humble and, 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 and quietly serve the King, whatever your, your, your personality or your ambitions or non-ambitions may be, all that is good. My point is this, regardless of all that, the gospel is to go out to all the nations. Well, I remember back in like 2001, I talked to my friend Mike Silva, who's an international evangelist, and I said, hey, Mike, can I go with you? And he's like, sure. And a bunch of things happen in church and stuff, and I never went. And I have been regretting that until these days. I thought, wow, my sisters in Nicaragua are tuning in. My, my member's friend in, in Vegas, who's from Sinaloa, who is coming here next week, is tuning in. And it's not about the metrics of old. It's about the gospel going forward. We finally are in an era, in those three areas, because of technology, the financial situation being upside down, and discipleship being upside down, where we can actually address the real needs of people. You know what the internet and all this stuff has allowed is a more direct line to the needs that people have. What this opportunity, this transition has allowed, it's given us a chance to go directly to the source of the problem, right to where the people are at. Here's what I mean. You know, normally you have, let's say, a family that comes in. So at first you want to greet them and make them feel special. Maybe a week or two or three goes by. You don't want to be too pushy and all that dance, right? And the family, the same thing. They are checking things out. There's this whole, you know, dog and pony show. And maybe in six weeks they come to a member's class. And then in a year, maybe they get baptized. You know the routine, right? Guess what? <laughs> Who cares about that now? There's no building. There's no process. I think we will come up with new processes. But we can now directly speak to people without any of the hang-ups of membership, of church attendance, of the dog and pony show. Do you, did you like the kids' ministry where the bathroom's clean? <laughs> if the bathrooms aren't clean right now, it's because they're your bathrooms. <laughs> Go
go wash your bathrooms. <laughs> now we can directly access people's real lives because for them it works because it's anonymous. It's the ultimate introvert dream, or really it's the ultimate fearful, I don't like church people or God or religion. It's, it's their dream come true. They can get the best of God, of relationship, of spirituality, of good advice, all from the privacy. It's like Amazon for church. <laughs> I remember two years ago, I was talking to an economist friend of mine, a member of our church, and I said, we need to start Netflix for church. We need to charge people $19.95 to get custom-made fitness, immune system training, uh, how to grow your own garden training, how to overcome anxiety, how to deal with emotional hangups, all online. Live streams, videos, webinars, and charge $19 a month to our church. First to recover the cost and then as a way to support the church. He's like, oh man, that's sinful, Trey. Is that even legal? The IRS going to put you in jail. Guess what's going to happen in 2020? If you are smart, you're going to move quickly towards a membership model for your church. This is what people did in the 50s. This is what our parents' generations did. This is what my dear brother Gary and Bill, who are in their 70s, did at their churches back in the 40s. They had membership, which meant dues. I still have little, little pieces of paper of that generation filling out little envelopes saying, this is my membership due for goods and services. This is not new, my dear friends. It's just we've become so afraid of talking. And really, I would say, because we've been offering such low hanging fruit to people. Why would people want to pay for fun, coffee, and, and, and a funny pastor. They can get that online. But where can people find, especially this year and next year and the next, content that is, for example, I had a friend tell me yesterday, she said, you know what I need, Trig? Because I'm doing these live streams. She said, I need three things. How to lose weight. How to um, grow professionally, because I feel stuck in my job. And how to raise teens, because I don't know what to do with these teens. Now, normally, if someone wrote that in a comment card at your church, you'd like say, OK, let's pray. Is there a ministry? You know, you would go through this whole thing to try to even listen to that person's concern. If your church is, let's say, 500 people or a thousand, I mean, good luck, right? Now, guess what? I can rearrange my content. And I already did a stream last night, so you can go back and listen to it in Spanish. I had like 10 people there, all entrepreneurial type Latina women who want to grow professionally. And I did a training. I'm going to do another one, I think, tomorrow with slides, the whole thing, to help these mostly younger moms in their 20s and 30s who want to grow professionally. That's what discipleship looks like. It's coming from a spiritual man through the, the, these technolo technological ideas. There's going to be plenty of them. You, you, my things are just what I'm hearing we have to be as leaders, people now that are thinking strategically on those three lanes, financial revenue. How are we going to generate financial revenue, not to make money, but to produce? This is what the, the you know, the Gary V's of the world have taught us how to provide value, how to itch. The, how to scratch the itch that people actually have. Like my friend said, give me those three things and I'll tune in. This is a leader in the church who's committed, who loves Jesus. She, that's where her life is at. How do I get help in these three areas? So that's what I'm doing. I'm providing content and then I'm going to partner. I've been doing a podcast for 10 years. I have about a hundred listeners. Some have thousands, millions. Some people don't even do have a podcast. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm already partnering with friends that I've been interviewing for the last five years to, pr to provide content for $19.95 a month so that I can pay for these cameras and, and, and the lights and the content and my guests can also, I can pay them for gas and, and just, you know, or if we do a Zoom, whatever, however we're going to do this long term and provide the Netflix of discipleship 
and of evangelism. Oh man, you're charging for the gospel, Trig. I mean, I, I, wait, wait, we're not charging for the gospel. That's tithes and offerings, right? In the Spanish church, ¿qué hacen las iglesias hispanas? They sell food every freaking weekend, right? Why do they sell food and not just give it away to pay for their bills? This is not new. This is just the church in America waking up to these three new tracks. How do we reinvent our financial? Thank you so much, my brother. Thanks for being here. How do we reinvent our financial systems? Second, how do we reinvent our technology, our worship gatherings, our online, as I said, being a online church with a physical presence? And then third, how do we reinvent disciple making? meeting the needs of people immediately not waiting for some process or membership or a program and volunteers and all the rest so that's the that's where i've been it's what i've been thinking about by the way if you would like to contribute down below ncfbellflower.com slash donate give your 25 dollar contribution so that you can see this ministry expand. You can continue to get free content. Soon it will not be free. I will have a lot of free content, of course, on all these platforms. But for the members, like Netflix, they will get content that is that goes right to where they're at. That is meeting the needs. And you're like, well, you, that's what YouTube is for. Yeah, but YouTube isn't personal. It's not from your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not from the people that you love. It's not from your friends. It's not personal. YouTube is, is like the, the eternal algorithm, you know? It's this, this, it's this brain that's floating in the air that knows all things, but it doesn't know you personally. Remember, the gospel is personal. And that's what this platform that I'm building is going to be about. It's going to be about those three things how do we use technology for community for worship for all of these things that are changing second as i said is a financial plan how do we reinvent our finances if you want to read up on this it's not this book isn't as i think as as relevant as what i'm telling you but uh, i think it's very close my brother mark damas he wrote a book called church economics it just came out like in february of this year i got an early copy he and i are, are friends through friends and that book it affirmed what in our spirit our church has been doing for the last three years did you know that we cut 70 percent of our budget in the last three years and by the grace of God right now, we are at a healthy place because we did all the tough stuff that churches have to do now. And it's not about cutting staff. I want to hire every, every staff member that I've ever had. It's about reinventing our financial plan. And so check out that book. Listen to my streams. I'm going to be providing free content on how you can reinvent your church economics. So if you are a leader in your church if you're a member if you're just simply an entrepreneur that wants to apply these principles are not just for church i've applied them to my online business to all of the things that i've done creatively in music and in coaching and of course in church leadership i encourage you to tune back here share this content with your friends tag all your followers share this on youtube instagram periscope twitter youtube facebook thank you so much for being here 